Welcome everybody to the final day of week two. Uh, we just spent the last 40 minutes playing a 12 player game of Hearts. Hearts is one of my favoriteest card games of all time. Uh, it's a little weird and it's a little different with 12 people. It's not exactly the um, authentic Hearts experience, which is one deck of cards and four players. But um, I've played large games of Hearts before in real life. My family would bust out two decks and we'd have eight people or ten people playing playing Hearts together. Um, it's it's the kind of game that's very simple. The rules are simple, but uh, you can play Hearts your whole life and um, get better at it. It's it's one of those games that has a really nice learning curve. You can get into it really fast. You can teach people to play it really fast. But the more you play it, the better you get at it. And at, at the competitive level, it's really a cutthroat game. Um, I was playing Hearts last month with my family, and my dad had the Queen of Spades, and he wasn't playing it. And so I thought, okay, well, he doesn't, you know, you know, play this card, goes around, he dumps the card, okay, okay, he doesn't have the Queen of Spades. No, he was just waiting for me to lead it again and take a trick so he could dump it on me because I was in the lead, you know, giving 13 points. So um, if you've got uh, enough spades to protect your queen, then you can sort of be really strategic about who you're going to throw the queen on and, uh, and give points to them because the point is to come into first place the least points. Uh, it doesn't. There's really no point in hammering on the person who's in last place, unless they're about to lose the game and you're in first place. Then you throw all the points on them to force the game to end, and you win. And so there's like all these different levels of of thought that go into hearts. Um, it taught me how to count cards. Um, you lead a seven, and the eight and the nine come out, and you've got the ten. You're like, okay, well the ten and the seven are functionally no, no different now, you know. Um, and you just sit there and count how many of the cards have come out, how many are above your highest card, if your lowest card's the lowest, or if there's still a you know one card lower than it. So if I've got the three, there's and I know the two hasn't come out, but hearts have, but diamonds have only been led once, then probably the three is not going to take the trick. So I'll play the three. My mom plays the two. My dad throws the queen of spades on it, and then you know my wife uh, plays the ten or whatever and, and, and eats it. Hang on one second. So, um, yeah, and so by playing hearts, you learn, it trains your memory. You get to really pay attention to who has what and what cards have been played and what's available and, you know, the odds you're going to eat a, a trick if you play a certain card. And if there's a queen out there, like, you're like, ah, I don't know, you know. And, and it's, it's, it's a game that really rewards practice and playing and, and training your mind and things like that. Twelve players, you have so few cards, there's, there's a lot less strategy in it because you Oftentimes, only got one card in the suit, and um, in fact, one of the strategies is just to throw a card out there that's middling, because you know, with twelve cards, with twelve players, somebody's probably going to have a ten or something. They're going to be stuck with, and so leading an eight is actually fine in a twelve-player game because somebody's going to pick it up. Uh, whereas in a um, four-player game, if you lead an eight, there's enough people with lower cards that they're going to. There's fewer people, and you have more cards per person. They're all going to duck it. So you play an eight, your daughter plays a four, your your wife plays a five, and then your dad throws a queen on it. Boom, there you go. You eat it. So it's a, it's a different game with a different number of players. Okay, so uh, will we split into groups for a game we make or no? It's optional. In the past, I have assigned groups to people. Uh, in the online COVID world, um, that has actually presented the biggest problem with this class. Just when it's online and... People just don't communicate with each other. It just turns into this big, passive-aggressive, like, nightmare. So if you want to form a group, by all means, do it. You know, up to groups of, I don't know, four or something. A-okay. Okay. But uh, I am not going to sign groups because I've, I've done it for the last two semesters uh, in this pandemic world we live in, and that has been the single biggest sticking point um, this semester. Okay, or this, this class. All right, so uh, that is our game design talk, and and game design is is a thing, you know. Like I was I was reading over a um, Reddit thread yesterday, and um, uh, people were talking about the importance of understanding the principles of game design, understanding genre, understanding what you're expected to do, what you're not expected to do, conventions, all that kind of stuff. I was talking about. It's like all right, it's cool. It's nice to get a little bit of validation, you know. Um, 
but the reason why I played Hearts with you guys was because it's a it's a different game from like you know first person shooter or something like that. It's a it's a trick taking game, and that's that's its own genre. And there's lots of people to play trick taking games. Spades is another very very popular trick taking game. Uh, same same general idea. You play a you play a card. People have to follow suit. If they don't uh, have a card of that suit, they can play a spade on it. A spade is a trump, and the spade will take it unless there's a higher spade. Played on the same thing. So um, uh, the the interesting 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 part thing about spades is that you have to guess before the game begins before you start playing how many tricks you're going to take. So if you say I'm going to take two tricks, and you take exactly two tricks, you score twenty points. If you say I'm going to take four tricks, and you take four tricks, you get forty points. But if you go over, you don't get ten points. You get one point for each card for each trick you take over. And if you go under, you get no points at all. So it's it really causes smoke to come out of your ears because you have to sit there and really look at your hand and be like, all right, realistically, how many can I take? It's going to be either four or five for sure. Maybe I could take even six or seven, depending on how it plays out. Um, four I know I can do for sure. Five, probably. And, um, and sometimes when you go over, you get a bag, and every ten bags you get reduces your score by 100 points. So going over is just as bad as going under, essentially, if you, get, if you go over ten times. So... Um, Spades is, Spades is a good game. It's a really good game. And um, cards, you know, card games, like I was in a, I was in a cabin yesterday, you know. Um, you just take a deck of cards with you, bust it out for the family, and you don't need to have a big board game or anything like this. You just pack a little deck of cards with you and play it. And, and Hearts and Spades are games that are really good games that are very simple, you know. And that's something that I think that everybody should kind of think about right like it, it is possible to make a game with really deep mechanics with really strong mechanics that nonetheless can be explained in this much text so uh my family has a couple of variants on hearts that we play with um a lot of people um don't allow i think the official rules depending on which official rules you look at they don't allow you to play the queen of spades on the first trick uh, and a lot of people think that's official because that's how microsoft's implementation of hearts was um, the one that I just played right there doesn't have that rule in it, and that's bicycle or whatever, foil, one of those. Um, and so my family allows you to play the Queen of Spades on the first trick, and so it's a viable strategy to dump all of your clubs, if you have the Queen of Spades, dump all your clubs, even like the two, and then that forces the person on the left of you to lead the two, and you drop the Queen of Spades on it, and hello, you know, <laughs> get, <laughs> surprise, you're getting, you're getting a Queen of Spades. And the reason why I consider that more interesting than the quote-unquote official rules is because if you can't play the Queen of Spades on the first trick, then the first trick is safe, and people just always play their highest cards, and it's just a free dump of a, of a high card, and that's the, the, and that's boring. What's up? Can I eat the last peach? Yes, go for it. So, uh, and so, again, it comes to meaningful choices, right? If, if it is not a meaningful choice on the first trick, if you just automatically play your highest club, and it's just a free way of getting rid of the ace, that's not meaningful to me. So... Uh, in, in my family, sure, you know, I'll probably play the ace if I have it, just get rid of it. But man, it, you know, there's always that, hmm, you know, my dad's smirking over there. Maybe I'll play the, maybe I'll play the three instead. And sure enough, the queen comes out, you know. He looks, he looks awfully satisfied, you know. And then my grandfather, about once per game, would try to take all the tricks. Like he would, um, and, and the passing of the cards is a huge amount of strategy too. He'd be looking at his hand, he's like, all right, I got a pretty good hand for tra taking them all. And so he would actually pass off his lowest cards. And so there's information. It's a hidden information game. But if I get cards from my grandfather and it's like two, three, four in different suits, I'm like, oh, he's shooting the moon, you know? And, uh, and then I would like hang on to like my one queen or something, you know, like a queen of hearts or something like that. I'd hang on to it for dear life so that I could hopefully take one trick and get one point for myself and force him to take 25 points and then I would take one rather than all of us taking 26 and him taking zero. So um, normally you're trying to go as low as possible but reversey, remember what was the original name of it, every so often if you take all of the tricks or all the points on the tricks then that's a reversal of the normal thing and all of a sudden people are trying to take tricks 
instead of dumping tricks. And the whole game flips into reverse. And that's that's a fascinating thing. And what's even more interesting is that sometimes people will bluff Tate shooting the moon. Like they'll lead the ace, they'll lead the king, they'll lead the queen. And they start picking up all these hearts. And then they're like, all right, I'm taking them all. And then people just start hanging on. They start discarding all of their low cards and start hanging on to all their high cards. Then you're like, psych. And then I've gotten rid of all my big cards. And you start playing small cards and everybody else gets stuck with everything, including the queen and all the other cards. And so it's a reversal to the reversal. It's a fascinating game. It's a really, really good game. And I highly recommend you guys um, play it more. Okay. Right. So uh, one thing that I wanted to talk about was the... Um, in the library, there is a uh, thing called content examples. So the content examples, which should be in everybody's um, everybody's vault, everybody should have content examples in there. Uh, that is a uh, I'm gonna update it, I guess. Uh, that is a set of museums that the um, the Houdini Niagara plugin cannot be found. Uh, sure, whatever. I might need to I might need to uh, uninstall and reinstall it. Um, so, um, the content examples has examples of content. <laughs> there's a lot of things in game development and there's a lot of things in Unreal Engine. And so, um, rather than me having to give a lecture on all of them, and some of them I can't, like cloth, I've played around with a little bit, but I can't lecture on it. You know, I, there, I, I just don't know it well enough to, to lecture on it. And, and things like um, animation, I've played around with more. I'll probably do maybe a lecture on it. Um, I have in the past. Um, but there's examples in there where you can literally see how, how things are animated. You can see how cloth is done. You can see how landscaping is done. Um, it's got all these different museums that are set up and they show you all the different things that are possible within the Unreal Engine uh, engine. And uh, it takes a long time to load too. It's loading right now. So I highly recommend all of you guys install it at home. And uh, if there's anything that you're curious about, um, I like the particle system, um, how to do a HUD, a heads up display, I'll, I'll probably do a lecture on that at some point too. Um, but there's only, there's only uh, you know, 20 days in the semester and there's only so many lectures, right? And so the content examples are there to fill in, fill in the gaps. Also, I should mention that the Unreal Engine uh, documentation is decent. It's not, it's not as good as I'd like it to be, um, but it's, it's definitely better than, it's definitely better than a lot of projects that I've worked on, which have, there's a function called maximize utility function, comment, description, this function maximizes the utility function. You're like, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> so, like if you want to look for landscaping, which we've been talking about. Um, uh, you can click on these different tabs here and they've got all these different sub tabs on how to do landscapes. Like on this one, they, they did a height blending. So let's see if they have a picture of it in here. Do they have a picture? Do they have a picture? This is going to walk you step by step through making landscape like we've been talking about. Sculpting, erosion, landscape materials. Uh, I believe they have a, um, they probably have an absolute height node in there somewhere that's going to add like a snow layer to the top of it. Uh, yeah, okay. I don't know if they painted this, though. Did they just paint it? No. That's not, that's not as good. But yeah, it, it's got step-by-step -step directions, and this is the stuff that some of you got stuck on, um, adding the adding the weight blended layer things on there. See how it goes from black to, like, you can paint it now. Um, but yeah, you can, you can actually set up your landscape to automatically put snow on the tops of mountains and things like that, which looks pretty cool. Um, landscape takes some tricks. Uh, it's up. They're going to talk about masking, maybe. Mm -hmm. 
odd box. Terragen is another procedural terrain creation software. So that's kind of cool. Um, so yeah, so the documentation, ooh, neat. Not bad, not bad at all. Looks really nice. Um, I was out in the desert, I was, in the, I was out in the Mojave Desert yesterday. You guys might have seen that I um, posted a, a shot of uh, the, uh, the landscape in the Mojave Desert. And uh, it, it looked like um, Unreal Engine, like when it lo goes into low frame rate mode and the, and the train becomes really blocky and things like that. Uh, the, the real life actually looked just like that. Everything's just super flat and there's just like, like that on it. Uh, I, my daughter was, I, I handed her the phone and as we were driving around, she was like taking pictures of the landscapes and things like that. So anyway, uh, this documentation here, I'll, I'll, I'll post it onto the chat channel. Um, it wants you to create a project and not add it to your project. That's correct. Yeah. For content examples, it's its own project. It's not assets that you put in your project. It, uh, it will create its own project. And then when you launch it, which, uh, takes forever. There we go. Hey. Well, I've been talking. Um, What's that? This is the content examples uh, museum. And so it's got, uh, when you come into it, um, it's just this little museum that's like about this big here. Shaders are still compiling. Uh, so you might, you might be like, all right, where's all the content? You know, is it through here? No, not through there. No, actually, <clears throat> if you go into uh, the, the maps thing here, let's see if I can change how I display this. Levels. Interesting. Um, under the maps folder here. Um, how do I change my um, under the maps folder here in content examples, uh, there uh, that's where you actually find the information. So if you learn how to do, if you want to learn how to do audio, you double click that. I know it's it's going to be compiling for a while now because uh, there's a lot of shaders in the in this thing. And so it's going to be chunking away on this for a while. If you want to learn how to have one blueprint talk to another blueprint, you can double click on that. Um, if you want to do a HUD, heads up display, double click on that. And all of the things you can click on, and you can actually open up their blueprints and look at how they do things. And that's just a really nice way of learning. This is, this is all made by the uh, Epic people. The blueprint input examples, if you want to, you can actually have a form pop up where you can type in like things. Like if you want to make a character sheet for a D&D game, you can um, walk up to something and it'll be like type in your name, type in your strength, and, or you have sliders and all that kind of stuff. It's pretty cool. Uh, uh, how to do mouse interaction. So like you can click on things. Um, uh, splines. Splines are 2D curves or 3D curves uh, even. Um, render to a target. So you can draw on, on a surface. Advanced blueprints. Blueprints overview. You might want to start there. Uh, character rendering cloth. Like I said, there's a level on cloth stuff if you want to do fabrics and things like that. Uh, decals are paint that appears on walls. Uh, dynamic scene shadows. Um, uh, no. uh, effects. Example project welcome, which is where we are here. FBX import, um, if you want to import things. Uh, geometry editing. Uh, Houdini Niagara, which is their particle, super cool particle effects system landscaping, um, scripting a level, level streaming, which is allows you to walk around and new chunks of the world will load as you walk ahead of you, which is nice if you have a big level. Um, lighting, of course, very important. Advanced materials, um, experimental materials, um, frame rate, come on frame rate, come on frame rate, you can do this. I'm not dragging on anything. Uh, material instances, which we've learned already, but you can go into there and learn more stuff. Look, it's loading. Yay, more shaders. Okay. Um, different nodes inside of materials, material properties, uh, the math behind video games, which we will get into for sure. Um, nav mesh, if you want to have AI navigate around a world, you typically build a nav mesh on it, which sort of pre-computes which parts of the world can walk to other parts of the world. And um, that shows you how to do it. You can even make it so if you have a dynamic world where like blocks are moving around, the nav mesh will update and the AI will, or you can make it so they can jump over, things like that. Um, networking, 
Niagara, uh, paper, 2D, parallax occlusion mapping, um, particle system, animation, physics. <sighs> There's a lot of stuff in here. Reflections. Um, uh, reflections normally are done in sort of the... Yeah, I'll double click on that and load it. Um, reflections are normally done sort of automatically, but um, they don't necessarily look very good. Um, the way that they do reflections um, by default is that it sort of takes the object and it, and it warps it um, based on the reflection surface. So it'll, it'll take whatever is rendered here and then just sort of warp it and draw that as the reflection. And if you, if you, if the object leaves the, the line, your line of sight, watch, do you see how the reflection goes away? So this is something called screen space reflections where it only reflects objects on the screen. If you're not rendering the thing, you can't, you can't do the reflection on it. Um, okay. Uh, over here we have reflections for non-metallic materials. So you got reflections on a plastic thing here and you can see the, the objects reflecting off that. Uh, box reflection capture actor, yeah. So, um, so if you want to do something better than that kind of sometimes okay, sometimes terrible screen space reflections, then you can set up a, um, uh, let's see if it's visible in here. Uh, yeah, that's a box reflection capture. And so you can actually put an object into a world and it will actually kind of photograph the world in all the different directions. And then objects will accurately reflect what's off the off screen, so to speak. So like if I'm looking this way, you can see it's reflecting those objects over there. See that? And they don't vanish when I do this. Uh, sphere reflection capture, so probably the same thing. Yeah, there you go. So it sort of photographs the world in different directions. Screen space reflections, dynamics, simulate or play. All right, let's hit play then. Of course, there's a cost to using these capture things, but if you want to have a good looking reflection, you need to do that. Uh, screen space reflections, dynamics, simulate or play. So. Capture cube dynamic. Uh, and then these these things have hyperlinks in them that you can click on to get more information. So 2D capture, so you can have a picture. It's a reflection as well. Okay. So um, so all of these things are set up as like museums. And you want to learn skin, you want to learn how to do UMG, which is their 2D interface kind of thing. It's useful for making heads up displays and things like that. Like in Zelda, when you got all the hearts on the top of the screen and you get injured, the hearts go away. That can all be done in UMG. Um, there's a lot of stuff in here. And when you guys are starting to get into doing your own game, which we'll be doing at the end of the semester, uh, at some point you're gonna be like, all right, how do we do, um, I don't know, lighting or whatever. And uh, so you can just come into content examples, double click on lighting, and, uh, and you can see they've got point light, spotlight, directional light, it's the sunlight, right? It's coming in from there. Um, right? Uh, static light, which doesn't move, dynamic object. You see, how, you see how this object here, which is marked as dynamic, uh, movable, uh, it doesn't cast a, it doesn't have a baked shadow, whereas this thing here, if I move it, you see how the shadow doesn't move, <laughs> right? Because it's it's pre-computed the lighting, right? The the uh, the shadow has been baked onto the surface. It's been pre-computed. Uh, stationary light, static object, dynamic object. What is this? A static light. Yeah. So stationary light. Uh, let's see if this updates for a dynamic object. Yeah. So this is recomputing the shadows in, in real time. Mobile light. Uh, so for this. Uh, yeah, and so for the mobile light, if I hit play, it might move around, and then you'll see it do the shadows again in real time. And so, uh, I oh yeah, that's a really cool thing, IES light pro profiles. So you can actually load. So IES is like the International something light association, light bulb association, or something like that. 
Um, every lamp and light bulb and things like that actually has a profile of like what direction the light comes out in. Like if you've ever looked at a light bulb, the light doesn't come out in every direction the same, right? There's brighter spots and there's dimmer spots and things like that. The IES profile is actually has nothing to do with video game development. It's just um, the International Association of Light Bulb People put out these profiles so that if you're a lighting specialist, and there's people who specialize in lighting, like if you're going to do a, a museum exhibit or something, then you can search for lighting that has the right profile for the effect you're trying to achieve. And Unreal Engine can actually read those professional IES profiles and import them into Unreal Engine, which is really cool if you think about it. And then uh, this uh, over here is somewhere in here. It's going to have the IS. There you go. Uh, the IS is going to be set on it. And so you can see that the, uh, the light comes out as if it was this actual physical light bulb in, in real life. What do, you, what do you guys think about that? So it actually holds sort of the amount of light that comes out in the different directions. Yeah, so you can actually go onto like the IES website and find like some cool spotlight or something, and and uh, and, and and import it into Unreal Engine. It's pretty cool. Uh, light functions. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, look at that. So it's flashing, and they've got some sort of mask that is uh, doing that. Yeah, you can also um, if you have like a rectangular light, like um, I don't know if they have an example of it in here because this is an older museum. Um, you can you can also have a, a light that has, uh, it, you can put an alpha mask on it. So rather than it just being a rectangular light, that's just a white square that's emitting light. You can put an alpha mask on it so you can have different shaped lights and things like that. So you can have like a, you know, a, a cross light shaped light or a circle shaped light or something like that. Uh, fall off, uh, this shows you what the fall off means. Uh, inverse square fall off, uh, indirect lighting. So if you shoot, if you shoot a light here, then indirect lighting will sort of have a bounce so this is bounce lighting have you, have you guys ever like um had like your school photos taken or something and like the like with a professional photographer and somebody has like a white um sheet of plastic or something held up to bounce the flash off it or something like that have you guys ever seen that before like photographers will have like sometimes like an umbrella um or or they have like an assistant who's just standing there holding a piece of white something uh, they're doing bounce lighting. And so the reason why they do that is if you have a flash, you can get a very harsh uh, silhouette profile. And so they'll have somebody off screen with a piece of white plastic or something. And so the light will bounce off it and the shaded part of your face, shaded part of your face um, won't be as harsh. And so UE4 does it. So you can see that this is picking up bounce lighting here. So they have a, a light here and then this is picking up the bounce, bounce light there. Source radius static lights, source radius zero, source radius 150. So you can have a light bulb that is physically larger uh, to do shadowing. Um, the red light is a point, essentially, and so it creates um, a hard shadow. Uh, if you have a bigger light, then um, it'll it'll do the computations, and you can see it has a softer shadow here. But also, it, it has uh, impacts on, like, a point light will cause the shadows to go out like this, whereas if you have a bigger light, the shadows will not spread out quite so much. Uh, light source radius effect on reflections. <laughs> Look at that. So the source radius on a reflection appears as a giant ball. Uh, light source length. So you can have a, a linear light. Soft source radius. So instead of a ball, it's kind of a glowy ball thingy. Um, anyway, I, I, I can go on this all day. It's it's it, There's a lot of stuff in there, and, and it really does explain... Um, all the different elements of Unreal Engine. And like I said, the documentation, like, um, it's it's not bad. And a lot of these things, as you go through them, there's, uh, oh look, a Geo map LED. Remember how we talked about that yesterday? Um, as you go through it, um, and maybe not with that one. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's see, edit layers, maybe. Uh, as you go through some of them, they actually have a button where you can like, um, kind of like click, I have finished this, I finished this and a little checkbox will appear. And so you can kind of keep track of where you are in a tutorial. Like if you're trying to build a landscape, as you go through, there's a little button, you click it and it's like, all right, you've completed this section. And then on the right hand side here, you can kind of see where you are. So if you come back later, you're like, oh, I'm, on, I'm on this part here or something. Okay. Um, 
see if I can find it. Here we go. Finish step. There you go. And uh, you can click down here and um, finish the step, and you'll see the things turn green. All right. So let's go ahead and go back into Spring 2021. Yeah. So um, game development is a huge, huge field. And um, one of the hardest things about teaching it is, A, I don't know everything, right? Like, like I've said before, I am not an artist. I am not a light person. You know, and there are people whose careers, oh, this is last, last semester, sorry. Um, there are people whose careers are in lighting, you know, a lot of theater people, but also um, uh, you'd be surprised, summer 2021, okay. Um, you know, how, how important lighting is. You know, if you're, if you're, um, you know, an architect and you're making an atrium, you know, how do you light it? You know, is an interesting question, you know? So, uh, and so you can like go really deep into lighting, you know, and it's like, I've, I've kind of, I kind of got the basics, you know, like I know what a point light is and a spotlight and how they cast shadows and all that stuff and how they control mood and things like that. But, uh, you know, I'm not a, I moved the opinion by the way. Um, I'm not like a lighting specialist, you know, I'm not a foliage specialist, you know, there's, you can, you, you can go really deep in a lot of these things. And I, I know the basics of enough of it to get by, but also there's just too much to teach. Like this is, this is a, you know, it's like teach filmmaking in a semester. You know what I mean? Like it's not, you know, it's not, I mean, you can, like I took film, I took a quarter of filmmaking, you know? You can kind of learn, you can, you can learn some stuff, and I actually learned some really useful stuff in filmmaking that um, I even use in my game development, but uh, it's, it's just a big field is what I'm saying. Okay, so we're going to continue our discussion of um, blueprints today. And, um, this looks bigger than it used to. Ah, there we go. Okay, there we go. Let's put it as a list, maybe. Just leave it as tiles and just shrink them down a little bit. If you hold down control and mouse wheel, you can make the stuff bigger or smaller. Okay, so last time, yesterday, we made this shattering glass blueprint. Um, so we have the object um, over here. Uh, we have it generate a... Uh, we have it generate a... Hit event. And then in the event graph, we have event hit. So when something touches it, it spawns an emitter. An emitter is a particle effect. Uh, so it's going to spawn an explosion. Then it plays the sound of an explosion. Then it destroys the actor. Okay, cool. Now, what other kinds of things we can do? Well, uh, event tick is a, a dangerous one. It's commonly used, but it's dangerous. What does event tick do? All right, so let's go ahead and right click on the open spot there and type event tick. So a tick means every frame. Every frame, and remember a video game is made up of frames. So the video card draws a picture on the screen and then it moves on to the next frame and it draws a picture on the screen and moves on. And you want to do this at least 60 frames a second, ideally. 30 maybe on the low end, but 60 ideally. And so it gives a simulation of motion by very just quickly updating the frames on the screen 60 times a second. And so if you update 60 times a second, then event tick, this event will trigger 60 times a second. If you have a frame rate of 30, it'll trigger 30 times a second. There's, there's two big problems with this. Can anyone think of what the problem is with, uh, with event tick? So I'm going to make event tick and I'm just going to hit print string and I'll just be like, hello, or I'll be like, um, I don't know, tick tock. Okay. Can anyone think of a problem with this? Compile, save, and just put in the bottom left corner and hit play. So if we come down here, you'll see that event tick is firing over and over again, right? You can see it's going tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. Right? Uh, if I show the frames per second, uh, is it hidden? Maybe hidden. There. We go. So I'm getting uh, 
80 frames a second right now, ish. Not bad. Dip down to about 60 every once in a while. I'm getting between 70 and 80 frames a second. So it's printing tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, 70 to 80 times a second. Prints every day, so it slows it down quite a bit. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's definitely that's definitely one one of the two problems is that if you have a lot of objects that every frame activate then it's going to it's going to start tanking your performance. If you've, if you've got a thousand AI on the screen and every frame all the AI do something expensive like search the world for all players and for every player found uh, draw a line between me and them to see if there's an open line of sight and if there is then move me towards them using a nav mesh. If you do that every frame your frame rate is going to go okay. So event take is something that uh, you have to use sparingly. Right. If you have to use it, you have to use it. If you have something that needs to happen every frame, it needs to happen every frame. It's not a big deal. Um, you just don't want to overuse it. You know what I mean? So yeah, it, it has a performance impact. Then there's another problem as well. So let me uh, demonstrate. Let's let's move it. Let's have this thing move. So. Um, So we're going to add some relative location. So this is like our translate tool, except in blueprints. So if you want to move an object, add relative location. We'll add it relative to um, that. Uh, if you don't want to add relative location, you can add world offset, add world offset. Um, you can you can adjust its absolute location as well, but I'm just going to move it relative to the um, center point right here. So that's zero 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 right here. It's just going to move. I'm going to move it up. So every tick, I'm going to move it up uh, mm, ten hundred ten units in the z direction. So it's going to move upwards. Okay. Compile save. Do you guys see what I'm doing here? So every tick, I'm going to move the um, static mesh component. The static mesh component is this thing here. Uh, it's not actually the object itself. The object itself is kind of at zero, zero, zero in this local coordinate space. It's going to move this component upwards. If I have other components, they won't move. Um, I guess I can add something to it if I want to add a new... Uh, eh, whatever. It doesn't matter. So uh, compiled, saved, snap it down here, hit play, and there it goes. All right, so off it goes. Never coming back, okay? So again, if I hit play, whee, there it goes. All right, so what's the problem? I didn't know I posted the other thing in the, in the help channel. Uh, yeah, yeah, the help channel is really for, uh, yeah, here. here. I'll lock down the, uh, the help channel while, while I'm lecturing. Lecture rooms for lectures and health channels for after hours. Typically, I lock down the, the rooms. Um, so, Dante Avina, we can hear you. Uh, can you? I don't. I don't see Avina in here. Uh, okay. Anyway, so what's the problem with this? What's the problem with this? Every frame it's moving up 10 centimeters. What's the problem? Yeah, don't, don't, don't worry about it, dude. You're all good. What is, what is the problem with this? Every frame we move up 10 centimeters. What happens if my computer slows down and I get 10 frames a second. How fast is the object moving? Don't feel that, dude. Seriously. Oh, he, he can't see me. Uh, he, he's not in the chat channel. Okay. Um, so, what happens if I have a faster video card? Anyone? What if you get a, what if I get a hundred frames a second? 
versus 10 frames a second. What's going to happen? Anyone? Because this fires every frame. This fires every frame. Not every second, every frame. So if I get 100 frames a second, it's going to fire 100 times a second. If you get 10 frames a second, it'll fire 10 frames a second. What's the problem? The problem is that this object will move faster or slower depending on what kind of graphics card I have, which is bad. If you have a video game, the game, like if, if you have a monster that's running after you, it should move the same speed whether or not you're using a, you know, 20, 60 or a 30, 90. You know what I mean? It shouldn't move faster at you because you've got a faster video card, right? You're like, what? You know? And so people would recommend, oh, yeah, if you're playing this game, turn on ultra graphic settings because then the monsters run slower. You guys understand what I'm saying? And this is actually a problem with old PCs. If you look at the uh, old um, beige box PCs, there, there used to be something called a turbo button on it. And the turbo button was, uh, every, everybody pushed it, right? Because you want your computer to be turboed. Uh, let's see if we can zoom in here. Um, Why is it not zooming in? What the hell is going on here? Okay, anyway. So there's a there's a turbo button right there, and everybody would always push it because you want your machine to run fast. What it actually was was the opposite. The turbo button was actually a slow down button. So that when you unpress the turbo button, it would actually make your 386 computer run as fast as a 286 computer. Or it would make your 486 computer run like a 386 computer. Because a lot of video games of the era. Uh, just assume that everybody had the same CPU. Everybody's got a 386. And so the monsters would move a certain amount every frame. And then you tried playing the game on a newer processor and all the monsters would be too fast. And so the turbo button was actually the non-turbo button. So you'd hit the button and your whole thing would slow down and you could play the game normally. Nowadays, because even uh, even with modern CPUs, there's quite a range of difference, right? A, a, a low-end i3 for a laptop is going to be much, much slower than an i9 top-of-the-line uh, beast, right? And so the way that we handle this, and this is something that it really needs to be, like, internalized. Like, you guys need to really pay attention to this. Like, seriously. Um, anytime you do something every frame, you must adjust for the frame rate. And we do this with delta seconds. Delta seconds is how many seconds it's been since the last frame. And this is true if you're doing blueprints. It's true if you're doing it in text-based coding. You must always figure out how long it's been since the last frame. And you can do that if you're a C++ programmer pretty easy. You get the current time. And then you remember the last time. And then you subtract it. It's pretty simple. You must adjust everything you do by delta seconds. And then that will make it run at the same speed, even if you have an old graphics card or a new graphics card, if you're on low detail settings, high detail settings, you must, must, must always multiply by delta seconds. So I'm going to type a little asterisk there and um, let's uh, promote this, Oops, split it, that's fine, and then promote. Okay, so this is going to be, so what I did was I split the vector into three variables and then I right clicked on the Z. Um, um, the amount that I'm going to be moving up in the Z direction and I hit promote to variable. And so this variable is over here and I'm going to rename it to upwards speed like that. And so it's going to be moving, if I want it to move up um, 10 centimeters per second, it's set to 10. The uh, If you have to hit compile and save. And then over on the right hand side here um, under the details panel, you'll see that 10 appears there. But that won't appear until you compile and save it. Um, and so I can so I can adjust its value up and down. It's like the parameters we had in the materials list. So if I wanted to move at one meter per second upwards, I'll set it to 100. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the speed and multiply it by delta seconds. And so this is going to be a float times a float. And I'm going to hook it up like this. And there we go. And you basically got to do this every time you use event tick. Um, don't ignore delta seconds. If you're doing something every, you know, if you're doing anything physical like movement or anything like that or rotation, whatever, the delta speed is the number of seconds that have elapsed since the last frame. 
So it's probably going to be something like 1 60th of a second. So if you want uh, to move the object upwards a meter per second, 100 centimeters per second, then uh, you have to multiply it by delta seconds. So 100 meters per second, and if that's a 60th, then it's 100 divided by 60. And you do that 60 times in a second, then it's 100. Right. So, um, so delta seconds is like 1 30th if you have 30 frames a second, 1 60th if it's 60 frames a second. If you're getting 100 frames a second, it's 1 100th. And so whatever your speed is, you normalize it to get the same velocity no matter what your frame rate is. So delta seconds here times speed, and that's going to be how far you move in one frame. And that's going to normalize the velocity so that it doesn't travel faster. So it's now moving one meter uh, per second upwards. And it doesn't matter if I slow down my frame rate or speed up my frame rate. It will always move at one meter per second. Okay. You guys understand? So I'll screenshot that. I'll screenshot it with upward speed. Promoted to a variable. Uh, it's called delta seconds, yeah. But um, it could be called like frame rate normalization or things, things like that. Because, like I said, like old old video games, uh, they didn't they didn't take this into account, and so games like even even modern games, you'd be surprised how often this bug crops up. Um, I think Minecraft had a, had a bug like that. Um, what was the name of the ad pen as well? Um, the ad pen, the ad pen, the multiply here. Um, you, you just type a star, like shift eight, and then you can find flip times flip. So if you drag out from a float, then it will only give you float <coughs> options because it's context sensitive. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, if you wanted to do something, uh, um, I don't know, if you wanted to move it up and then maybe uh, once it hits an altitude, a maximum altitude, then have it go down, something like that, uh, you can, I can show you guys how to do that if you're interested in adding a little bit of logic to it. Um, I know shami has been eager to do programming. Actually, I don't know that. I'm just picking on him, I guess. Uh, it's going to do another one of those emojis, like, the guy is what? Um, no, nah, just, uh, I've been very eager for programming. Yeah, let's learn how to do an if statement. Okay, so let's make it so that rather than this thing saying, I, I must go my people need me, and then having it fly off into the atmosphere, rather than that, let's uh, let's make it so that it, uh, let's make it like a platform. In fact, yeah, let's actually make a moving platform. Not, let's, let's, uh, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna delete this thing here. Uh, I'm just going to leave shattering Mr. Shattering Glass as Shattering Glass. Uh, just verify everything still works. Boom, cool. I'm actually going to, let me make a little uh, moving platform, huh? So, uh, you know, my daughter made this cabin last night. Uh, she was kind of working on that yesterday. And so she built this little thing here for you guys. So let's, let's make a, like, you know, in a video game, there's like a little platform and it goes up and down. And I'm going to add an elevator to take people to the top of your cabin. How about that? Does that sound good? I need to make it two stories then. You need to make it two stories then? Uh, you can do that during the break, okay? Mm. But I, do you want to see the elevator? Okay. So, uh, what should the elevator look like? An elevator. It should look, um, I don't know if I have one of those. Um, how about the stairs? No? Okay. No. Maybe stairs too tall. Maybe a table. It floats up and down. No. No? I, I got a limited palette of options here, girl. Here, here, here. Uh, hang on. I, I, I know, I know. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Maybe a door with, in a, that you can go into a, like a box. Maybe just a box, yeah. Okay, fine. No, no, no. Yeah, no, this is, this is, this is your classic video game elevator, right? So just have a little... It's a door with a box. With a box. There you go. Okay, how about that? All right, so we got a little... No, this, 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 there, there, there. Wait, can I try something? No, 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 no. This is this is your classic video game elevator, so it'll just go up and down, right? So, right. What what did you want? What did you want to do? Okay. Take a box. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
She's eight years old. So, you guys think it's too hard to fit a box in the world? Remember an eight-year-old too. <laughs> Making a little platform. Or what's uh, what's the plan here? Oh, okay. Yeah, I see what you're doing there. Yeah. So it's like the uh, it's like the side of the elevator kind of thing. Yeah. Made it. Remember, you can use W, E, and R to switch between those three. That's pretty good. Hit W. Or, nice. So you're making like the side of the lift. A little more, a little more realistic. All right, that looks good. All right, thank you. Girl. <laughs> You uh, control W'd it. Okay. So you're making the other side. Uh, okay. All right. All right. Gotcha. Okay, that looks good, girl. All right, thank you. Nope, but, and then you put a door right there. Yeah, yeah, we can work on this later, though. My students are waiting on me. Thank you, Ada. Thank you, Ada. Right. He shows how to connect three different objects together, sure. Like, uh, I've got the uh, penguin here, so I've got it all grouped together. Those were, all, those were all originally, you know, different uh, objects, right? Like, you know, it melted. Ah! What I do, I think what I do is I usually will just like highlight the whole thing and then I just move it out. Yeah, you can you can select them all and then you can uh, I think it's Control G to group them. It's like if I wanted to. Uh, Don't mess with it. So if I oh, they are grouped already. Huh, look at that. Okay. No. How did I? Did I do that by accident? Did you group them in? Weird. Might have pressed the wrong button. How did these guys get grouped? That's weird. Okay. Anyhow. Uh, yeah, they're grouped. So, um, I think it's Control G. Can like, you if, you, if, if you control click things, right click, you can hit, yeah, group, Control G. And then they will move together. Like that. Okay. And then if you uh, ungroup with Shift G. Can you use, you know, like, when, like... Can you use this thing where, like, you know, if you for the sliding door, if like you go close to it, and it goes down. Mm -hmm. Instead, if you go if you go onto it, it goes up. Yeah, yeah, we can do that. But we're gonna start off by just having a timer. Like it'll just be a, a thing that just constantly moves up and down like this. Okay. So, uh, what material should this be? Should it be a golden elevator, a chrome elevator? Uh, I think. Chrome looks kind of nice. Maybe just normal. Just white. Just oh yeah, actually, chrome looks good for the bottom. Yeah. Chrome looks Copper? Uh, no, no. Gold? No. Alright. Chill. Chill. <laughs> it looks like marble when you do that. When Ooh, you do that, it looks like marble. This is the infinite mirrors effect here. You, you can see the limitation on the uh, reflection engine from that. <clears throat> we'll, we'll just leave the sides blank. Okay. So, we are going to make this block here slide up and slide down. Just over and over again. Like in a video game, right? Like platform-based video games. So I've got this box here selected. It's not inside of the walls. That's good. And I'm going to choose Blueprint Add Script. And so like what we did last time, I'm going to just put it into the build directory. And I'm going to call this one uh, the Eternal Elevator. Because it's just going to go up and down over and over again. Okay. And uh, all right, see girl. Um, and so, um, we are going to just have it on event tick, I guess. We can get rid of these. 
here, or maybe on begin play. Hmm. Yeah, let's actually let's actually do something with, with begin play. So begin play, begin play is an event that gets called exactly one time when the object gets placed in the world. And so what I would actually like to do is for it to remember its starting location. So that if we have multiple eternal elevators, we don't have to hard code in, this is the start, this is the end. Uh, it can actually look at its current location and be like, oh, this is where I am. Okay, cool. And then, uh, and so you can have multiple elevators in the world. You don't have to like reprogram each one of them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, drag out from event begin play. And I am going to choose get world location. Let's see, get... World position. Uh, Trouble is, there's always synonyms for these different things. Uh, get location, get last name location, get object location. What the hell? Hmm. Mm. Sometimes the context sensitive menu also hides things. Uh, get world lo origin location, maybe. No, that's not that one. Turn location of the component and world space. Okay. Oh, it, yeah, right, you can't drag that out from white because it, it doesn't require a white pen. So when, whenever you drag out from something, if you have context sensitive on, sometimes that, that will um, hide the things you're, you're, trying to, <laughs> you're trying to find. I want to get my world location, but because it doesn't take a white pen, it gets hidden, right? And then you sit there and go like, is it called something else? Is it world position? Is it world translation? Is it... You know, because there's synonyms for the same the same things, right? So get position, you know, and then you sc scroll around like, all right, is it position? Is it you know, translation? Yeah, you know, and it, it's just a matter of the, uh, this actually doesn't require a white pen to do it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new variable. So uh, there's a couple different ways you can create variables, but... Um, you can right click on things and promote them to variables. That's kind of the shortcut way of doing it. I'm going to show you the slightly slower way of doing it. So if you see over here on the left hand side, there is a variables tab that holds all of your variables. Currently there are no variables. So you see how there's a plus there. We're going to click on the plus boop, and it creates a new variable. This one is going to be called our starting position or whatever. And uh, you notice how it has like the red uh, cheek lay looking thing there. Click on that. That is the type of variable it is. And I want this to be a vector. A vector holds an X, Y, and Z location. So I can do that. And uh, there's a little eyeball there that is um, if other blueprints are going to be able to see it. Um, or if it's visible out in the world editor. I'm going to turn it on. Um, at the place you're at right now, probably always turning it on is a good idea. Um, I, I know there's going to be some people screaming in outrage at that. Um, you might as well. Like it, it's not really going to hurt anything if you if you turn on because then when you go out into the the world editor to compile it and save it, um, you'll see that there is uh, going to be the variable appears here, and so you can you can um, you know if there's any reason for the world editor to to have access to it, you might as well make it visible to the the world. Uh, Technically, nah, I don't think it needs to know that. Okay, so I'm going to turn it off. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag. So once you've created a variable, you can uh, drag it onto the blueprint screen, and two options will appear. To get the current value of the variable, or you can set the value of the variable. And so I'm going to set it. And setting does require a white pen. So setting is an, an, an action. Getting a location isn't, for whatever reason. It, it just is. And so I'm going to hook it up like this. So what's going to happen is that when I begin playing, it's going to set the variable uh, starting position, which is an X, Y, Z. Uh, it's going to set it to whatever my current location is. And so I'm, I'm essentially writing down where I started. And the reason why I do that is because if I sit there every tick adding locations and subtracting locations, 
uh, who knows, it might start actually drifting away from its start. And so if you always kind of uh, do it in reference to its starting location, then it'll never wander off, you know, too much. Um, floating point numbers should always make you somewhat uh, paranoid as a programmer because floating point numbers are not accurate. They have error in them. And so if you add 10 and you subtract 10, you might be like, wait, why didn't I get zero? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I had a bug in my game engine because I, I did all the algebra and I proved it was correct. And I was not getting zero because I was adding up all these numbers and I was subtracting all these numbers, floating point numbers. And I was not getting zero. And I was, I was like, what the hell is going on here? It's the same numbers. I'm just adding them in one order and subtracting them in the other. Error. You know, and uh, I was just like, <sighs> that was a fun bug to hunt down. And by fun, I mean, it was excruciating. And that's why I have a bald spot because I've been ripping my hair out over that uh, bug. Right? You can prove something mathematically correct. That doesn't mean it's going to work right in the real world. So here we go. Uh, we have set the uh, we have set the starting position and begin overlap. We don't need. Um, event tick. So every tick, we are going to move the elevator. And uh, we're going to need a couple more variables. We're going to need one for if we're going up, and we, we're going to need one if we're going to go down. Uh, oh, I, sorry, that's the same one. Uh, but we need a, a second one that is sort of the max elevation, right? So the max elevation um, should be uh, maybe configurable in the world editor. Yeah, so let's... Uh, Let's make a variable here of type um, float, and we're going to call this rename, please. Um, we're going to call this max elevation, so that's like how high up it can go before it reverses course. That one I will make public, so that if I add multiple elevators to the world, I can have each one have a different maximum elevation on them. Um, so that one will be editor uh, editable by uh, uh, what happened here? Target must have a cache. What happened? Target itself? Oh, it's stack image. Okay. Um, okay, so it's going to get the location of the static mesh component, which is the so it's going to get its location, save it, and then uh, it's going to use this variable here, max elevation. Again, you have to save and compile before this appears. I'm going to have it default to mm, three meters, maybe. Three meters seems like a good number. And then I'm going to um, I'm going to add uh, I'm going to add just the Z component. Um, so I'm going to take the starting position and I'm going to add three meters up to it. Um, if I wanted, I can make max elevation a vector as well. Uh, I'm not because it's this thing's only going to move up and down. Maybe we can make an invisible garden. An invisible garden would be or, cool. Or maybe something that looks Secret like garden? it's a floating garden above the house. A floating garden above the house. You could. Yeah, that'd be neat. The elevator would take you up there. That'd be really cool. And then there's like a glass. Uh, there's, there's a sheet. And then you turn off visibility on it, but but you can still walk on it even though you can't see it. Yeah, yeah, we can do that. That'd be yeah. fun. You can turn off visibility on objects, so you can walk on them even if, even if you can't see them. That's and what then I'm gonna put like some like little areas of soil and plants in them. Very nice. Yeah. So if your if your disk is full, um, your your whole project, um, Avina, can be found. Uh, if you if you're curious where it is on disk, right click, choose Show in Folder. And then that will jump you to the file explorer where your project is. Go up one level. That's the folder that has your whole project in it. You can just uh, move it to move it to some other disk. Wait, how come okay. nobody did for the for the snow for the snow um for the snow project did like a a. a a snowman took off his nose and is holding the pointy side toward the viewer, like this, very threatening. Mm -hmm. So uh, I want to add 300 just to the Z component of this, right? The Z component's the up, up direction. So there's a couple of different ways I can do this. Um, the easiest way is to break this open. So if I right click on the pen 
<clears throat> right now this is going to have an X, Y, and Z, but if I right click and choose split, then it turns into three different floats. <coughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, take the Z pin, hit plus, and add the max elevation to it. If you drag it onto the pin, nice, it does the get for you automatically. And so I'm going to take the starting position, I'm going to add 300 uh, by default, this is a settable parameter, I'm going to add 300 in the Z direction, and this is going to be the ending spot. So there's going to be a starting spot here, an ending spot three meters above. Do you guys understand? Like, up three meters is what I'm doing here. And then I need to set this as a new variable. So I'm going to make a new variable here called ending position. And this also needs to be a vector. It's going to be a vector like that. And I'll keep it private. Um, the only thing the world editor will see is the max elevation that you change, how much it goes up. Uh, so I need to turn this back into a vector. So uh, you can, you can uh, there's a way of combining floats into a vector called make vector. Yes, uh, make vector, there we go. And so uh, whatever the X was is the X, whatever the Y was is the Y. And the Z is gonna be the old Z value plus 300. And as always, there's different ways of doing these things, align, straighten connections, thank you. And uh, th this is just a pretty straightforward way of doing it. So what I'm doing is I'm taking the Z component here, adding 300 to it, and then I'm gonna turn this into a new variable and this variable uh, is going to be saved as ending position. So I can type set ending position, or I could drag the variable out. Like I said, in Unreal Engine, there's like nine different ways of doing everything. Um, so I'm going to save this variable. Okay, so I've got our starting position, which is wherever it is in the world to begin with. And then the ending position is going to be um, uh, saved as the starting position plus 300 up. How'd you get the plus? Uh, uh, right click and type plus. Float plus float. Yeah. So if you drag out from a float and you hit plus, it'll show you only the float edition. If you right click with nothing selected, the context six, the contact, context sensitive menu doesn't know what type you're working with. So all these different additions pop up. That's why it's usually better to drag out from a pin, because then it limits it just to the ones that match the types that you have. Um, although, as we saw here, uh, it can uh, it can sometimes hide things that you're, you're trying to find. So, um, right click, align, strip connections, okay. Okay, good enough. I like having my things all lined up. Okay, so we've now got a variable for the starting position, ending location, and we need one more variable, and this variable is gonna be called going up. Going up or going down. If it's true, it is going up. If it's false, it's going down. Okay, so this needs to be a red variable. In, in Unreal Engine, there all the different types of variables are color-coded. Yeah. So green, hang on one second, green is a float, yellow is a vector, red is a Boolean. A Boolean is something that is either true or false. We're either going up or we're going down. Yes, girl. Um, two things. Yes. Can we have it pause a few seconds on the top so uh. we can get off? Oh. Um, yeah, maybe we can add that next. That's a good idea. Because the yeah. The, because the place you're going off is faced this way, not right, this right, way. Right, 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 right. Yeah, probably a good idea. Um, yeah, we, 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 on yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's a good idea. But for now, we're just going to have it just go up and down, like in, like in a Mario. Uh, level. Okay, so going up uh, doesn't need to be public. Yeah, maybe it does. So maybe we can default to whether it's going up or down. Um, compile and save, and then we can choose whether it is going up by default, and yes, it will be going up by default. Yes, Carl. Uh, and another thing, maybe we should make like the the side, the wall that's facing this way, uh -huh. um, glass. Oh, so you can see it? Yeah, it's probably a good idea. I'll, I'll, I'll let you mess, mess with it during the, during the break. Okay, so what we want, now that we've got all this stuff set up, do you, do you guys kind of understand conceptually what we're doing here? We've got a starting position, we've got an ending position. We're saying by default it's going to rise. When it hits the top, we're going to want it to flip around and say going up is false, and then it's going to go down. Once it's the bottom, we're going to flip it and it'll go up. Once it hits the top, it'll flip and go down. 
Do you guys kind of understand at like a conceptual level what we're doing here? Um, like, because uh, I, I know we have people that have programmed before and people that haven't programmed before. So, uh, what about a pause at the top? Yeah, that's what Ada was just suggesting. Um, we, we we can we can work with that later. Um, we we can add that. I, I just want to get the basic. It, it, I, I always like to start with just like the basic functionality of something and then um, work from there, right? Whenever I'm coding, um, I always start with the smallest, smallest thing that I can get to work and compile and run and test. And I build a little bit more and test it, and build a little bit more and test it, and build a little bit more and test it. Um, even this with all these different things here is a little bit too much for me to be really confident. So. Uh, what we'll, uh, we'll, we'll and we'll need to we'll need to test all these things, but um, in fact, let's do it right now. Let me show you how to do this. So, uh, how do we know that these things are being set properly? Right, right now it's all zero zero zero. How do I know? How do I know if it's actually going to be the starting position plus three hundred? Well, check this out. This is actually huge. This is something you guys all need to pay attention to. Uh, do you see here where it says toggle breakpoint? So if you hit toggle breakpoint, what that's going to do is that when the game runs and it gets here, it will stop. And then you can mouse over these different variables and actually see what values they have. Yes, girl? No, no, oh, you're just waving your hand. Okay. So I'm going to hit compile, save. I'm going to snap it down here and hit play. No, now, you notice that immediately the game stopped because this is during event begin play. It's at the level load. So the level itself is still black, right? Because the level hasn't even loaded yet. But now that it's low, now that we've paused here, it pauses the game. Now you can mouse over these values. So get world location, mouse over it. Okay, we're at x is equal to 1292, y is negative 954, z is 112. And if we mouse over this, x is 1292, x is 1292, y is negative 954. The z value of the current uh, location is 112, plus 300 is 412. So we did successfully add. 300 to the Z value. And so the ending position that we're saving here is going to be um, 412, okay? And so uh, the ending position after this, it, it stops before it runs, so it's still not quite set yet, but you can look at the pin here. You can see that it's about to become the right value. Okay, cool. Then uh, we can step if we want um, and step over. And now ending position has been set. And then now that I'm happy that that works, I hit F9, turn the breakpoint off, good to go. Okay, and hit stop. If, if it's still playing, you're gonna you're gonna have a really weird experience. So everything, all the variables are being set properly. Cool. Um, that right clicking on anything, any node you have, you can right click and choose to add a breakpoint to it, and then the game will run and pause there, and then you can just mouse over the different variables and see what they are. It's a really fast way of debugging your stuff and trying to figure out what's going on with it. And if the breakpoint doesn't happen, then you get into the Unreal Engine hell of like, okay, why is nothing happening? <laughs> why is begin play not being called on my object? Oh, Lord, what's happening? You know, you get a spiral into darkness. <laughs> okay, so uh, what we want, now we're gonna get to the, the guts of the, si of the situation. So what we want, is uh, we're going to need another variable that's the speed it goes up. So um, upwards speed, upwards velocity, it's speed, speed, yeah, speed, upwards speed, uh, because it's um, the magnitude of the speed, not the direction, although it's always upwards. I don't know, whatever, it's semantics. And I'm going to make this one public as well so that the um, in the game editor, I can actually set these parameters. So if I make a new, if I make a new elevator, I can change its max elevation, uh, if it starts going down or if it starts by going up, and I'm going to use its uh, upward speed. Um, I guess I could have a different variable for downward speed. So it might go up fast and then down slow. That could be fun. So I'll make another one. And this one will be called downwards speed. I guess that's kind of cool. That might be a neat little, little feature there. And I'm going to make these public so that the editor can, can edit them. So if I can have all sorts of elevators in my game. And I don't need to make a new blueprint for each one. I just duplicate it and then change these variables.
Okay, so here we go. If statements. Here we go. All right. If we are going upwards. If we are going upwards. Uh, branch. Okay. Branch is the name for an if statement in um, Unreal Engine. I think maybe if you type if, it might do it. If Yeah, if you type if, it, it jumps to branch as well. I think that's a alias def setup. So if you type if, it'll give you a branch. And so a branch has two different uh, two different uh, outputs. One is if the condition is true. One is if the condition is false. And so the condition we're going to branch on is going up. So I'm just going to drag that over like that. So if we are going up, if we're going upwards, then it's this is going to come out. That, that Whatever is attached to this runs. If going up is false, in other words, we're going down, then this one will run. Do you guys understand? So we can have two different two different flows of execution coming out of the branch. One if we're going up, one if we're going down. Okay. So if we're going up, then what we're going to do is we are going to add um, local actor world transform adds a delta to the transform of the actor in world space. Um, <laughs> world offset. Uh, there's a couple different ways of doing it. Um, how do we want to do this? Um, add, and we'll just do add relative location like we did before. There's a couple different ways of doing it, but uh, we'll do that. And so this is the same code that we had before. Um, remember, we need to use delta seconds, right? So delta seconds times, oh, what happened here? Delta seconds times uh, upward speed. Drag that over there. So upward speed times delta seconds, it'll normalize based on the frame rate. And that is going to be added. I can right click on this. Yeah, it's doing the bug again. No, why are you doing this to me in religion? Split pin. So I'm just going to add to the Z. Uh, oh, it's doing the same bug. It's so frustrating. Okay. So if we are going upwards, then it, this will execute and it's going to add the upward speed to the Z location. And it's going to be normalized so that your frame rate doesn't affect how fast it goes up and down. It's going to smoothly move up or down no matter how fast your frame rate is. And it's doing the bug. It's doing the bug again. Um, okay. All right. And then after, um, after we uh, move, now we need to check to see if we hit the, uh, if we hit max, right? So, um, uh, we're, All right, I'm gonna have to reload again. This is so irritating. Why does it do this? Let's see if I make it smaller. Sometimes making it smaller fixes it. Nope, it's doing the bug. All right. Um, close it. Uh, sorry if I asked the question too many times. No, never apologize for asking questions. Dude. That's that's what we're here for. Just gonna reload. Okay, so uh, what about a pause at the top? I know it probably has a little bit to do with animation as well, but the programming section will be able to teach some of the more difficult parts of game programming. Everyone to know, simple to normal melee systems. I know I'm talking Dark Souls stuff. Just can I swing a sword with the left click? Yeah, that's more of an animation. So you can play an animation, and then what you do is you set up a hit like we did with the glass thing, so that when the thing collides with something, it fires an event, and then uh, you do damage. So um, you'd have a variable on it called, um, you'd have a variable on it called, you know, damage or whatever. And then when the thing does a hit, you add that much damage to their health, you know, you take the health off. If their health is zero, you do a kill, kill thing. Will we go over animation? Yeah, probably next week. Probably next week. It's not something I'm good at, but I can, I can go over it. How do you separate them? I don't know what happened here, girl. You did this, not me. Okay. No, 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 no. We only got 20 minutes left, girl. We'll we both make them glass. Then. It's fine. It's fine. Uh, you want this to be glass? <laughs> okay. Um, starter content. Materials. Glass. Yeah, cool. All right. 
Okay, so we were here. We're editing the blueprint of this. All right. And so what we want is if it's going upwards, we add its upward speed to its Z. Z is the up direction. And then if we hit max, then we need to flip it and start going downwards. So uh, we need to do another comparison, another branch. And we need, we need to say, is our current location... Um, Is our current location um, is our current location higher than the max elevation? If it is, then set us to go down. So how do we do that? Uh, well, let's get our current position, uh, let's, uh, or let's get the ending position. Either way, get ending position, and we're going to split the pin open. That's all we care about is the z, and then we're going to get our current location. Get uh, get, get earth. Get the world location of the static mesh component. Yeah, okay. And that one uh, way down here. And that also we're gonna split open. And so what we're going to do is we're going to compare the uh, Z location we're at right now. If the Z location, I just type greater than. If the Z location we're at right now is greater than or equal to the max that we're allowed. Did you guys see that? So I get the location of our platform. If it's Z location, if it's elevation is above the maximum we're allowed, then we're going to reverse course and we're going to go down. Do you guys understand that? It's just Avina is talking, and I know Avina's done this before, so the people that haven't done programming before, please tell me if this is confusing to you. Do you understand, like, we have an elevator, and when it hits the maximum elevation, it's going to turn around and go down. Uh, how about, it, um, when you're doing something more advanced, can we make it stop in the middle so you can get off? Yeah, that's... And then it'll continue going up to, the, to like, the invisible garden. Yeah, that, that he, he suggested a pause as well. Okay, so, uh... So what I did was I dragged out going up, and I'm saying set going up to be false. That's true, that's false. Okay. So if if our new location is above, greater than or equal to, if the new location is greater than or equal to the max that we're allowed, then set going up to be false, and it's going to reverse course. Uh, and then I'm just going to copy and paste all of this stuff here, and do the same thing for the downwards. Control W. Move over here. And so if we're going downwards, then um, if we're going downwards, the only change is that the downwards speed, uh, we need to set that, don't we? Uh, downward speed, maybe negative one meter per second. The upward speed is, no, that needs to be set also. The upward speed should be 300 or something. I mean, maybe that's too fast. Maybe the upward speed of two meters per second and the downward speed is one meter, negative one, negative 100. And uh, that's it. So instead of upward speed being used here, we will use downward speed. Again, I just drag it over like that. And there we go. So uh, So there are our two different branches. Here. Whatever. Okay. Um, <clears throat> that's kind of overlapping. Come on. Let me click on you. There you go. Okay. So that is our elevator. Screenshot. Right. Well, uh, it needs 
to go up. Sorry, there we go. Okay, so if, uh, and then and then for this one over here, actually we're not quite done yet, right? So for this one, uh, we want it to go up if we are below the um, starting position. So rather than the ending position, we want to say starting position. So we're going to get the starting position and we're going to split it. And we want to say if the Z location is below, the Z location is below, if it's below the starting Z location, then go up. Okay, so for this part, if we exceed the max, then we say go down. If we, uh, for this one, if we go below the minimum, then we say go up. And so this thing will bounce up and down between these two boundaries, hopefully forever. Let's see if it works. First time's the charm, right? Nope, it does absolutely nothing. Okay, cool. Uh, you didn't walk into it though. Ooh, mobility is, <laughs> it's not set to movable. That's why, okay. So let's make this guy movable. <laughs> All right. Wait, are you allowed to push it then? Let's try it now. There we go. All right. Cool. Ooh, it's not heading downwards uh, though. It's supposed. It's supposed to. It's a. Uh, Dad, it's supposed. It's supposed to be higher than that. I know. And also, and also, it's supposed to be connected to the glass. Oh, it's, well, it's, it's supposed to be connected to the glass. All right, so let's see if we can figure out what's happening here. So it's moving up. That worked. Uh, max elevation three hundred. It needs to be a little bit higher, like you said. Let's make it. Let's make it four meters high. Going up by default. Upward speed is two hundred. Downward speed is negative one hundred. All right. Let's hit play. There you go. So it's going up almost to the top now, but it's can not going down. The glass. Goes. It's not going down. So let's try and figure out why it's not going down. Can we make the glass go with it? No, I like it like this. This is like a little, uh, it's like a little, um, you know, protective layer or whatever. No, okay, so, so I was it's planning on making a door there so it's actually like an, a modern day elevator. Okay, so if, if we're going down, so let's set up, let's see here, down. Oh, why am I multiplying this by zero? That's why. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> That's why it's not going down. Okay. Delta seconds, thank you very much. Compile, save, and run. Goes up and then down. Okay, now you'd see that it's going up twice as fast as it goes down. Okay. And it's not quite up at the top, so I'm gonna add a little bit more to the max elevation here. Again, without having to recompile my code. That's why you make public variables. So I can just hit play again, and then just eyeball it. Eh, no, still not quite enough. Let's make it 450. Hit play, and there, yeah, that's good. Uh, maybe, maybe even a little bit more, let's say top 100. Yeah, okay, that's good. And so I can come down here and step up onto it, and then it takes me up to the top of the building. It's a little bit over the a little bit over the thing, maybe, maybe 480. Maybe 480. So this is a this is an animation that we're just coding directly. We're not using a timeline. Uh, a timeline is probably a better way of doing this, uh, but um, we're just coding this directly as a way of showing you guys how to, how to do this. So the elevator, yeah, good. and then we've got this little glass protective layer here. You can ride the elevator up and down. And if we want to, we it, can... It, it needs to pause. It needs... I know. I know. Uh, if we want, we can make another elevator. And this elevator can, I don't know, take us up to the top of the cliff or something. Yeah. We can go over here. What's the point of hiking, then? Uh, yes. Yeah, it's, it's a video game. Uh, I don't think he can get... Wait, are you allowed to walk inside the mountain right now? No, you're not. Okay, so we'll do that, and then this, our max elevation will be set to mm, 2,000 or something. The upward speed will be set to be 400, downward speed negative 400. Okay. Save. Saves a lot faster than on my laptop, that's for sure. And then if we look over here, you can see we've got an elevator. And so we can just sit there and make as many elevators as we want and hop on. There we go. And, 
Then you can't get uh, uh, No, I can't quite make it. Oh. Death. Is that falling damage in the game yet? All right, let's see if I can do this. Whee! Got it. All right. So. There. And so you just add, you just add elevators to your game. You know? You can see they're, they're just kind of running, running around like this. Can we make a secret base inside the mountain? Like, make it like you're able to walk into it? Uh, you could, you could. Uh, well, not inside of the landscape, probably. Okay. Um, Maybe expand the stone so big you can walk into it and just like build a house in it. Yeah, and so this isn't this isn't great because um, you know it's running every every tick, but it's it's a good way of demonstrating the principles of the matter. So um, uh, what do we got two fifteen. Uh, let's do one more thing. Let's let's add a front door to Ada. Ada, Ada you wanted a door on the uh, on the elevator here. Uh, yeah, but not anymore because the arm go isn't going with it. How about a door here? Yeah. Front door to the... Okay. I, I didn't... You wanted me to give you the computer so I didn't have enough time to do so. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so let's, let's, let's add a little door like this. No, Daddy, is... Uh, no, 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 wait. Isn't there a... A door mesh? Yeah. There is. Aren't you using it? Everyone's a critic. Uh, door. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. There we go. And we'll make it a little bigger, a little fatter. Uh, a bit bigger. Bigger. Okay. Yeah. Uh, can we flip it to the side so? It can you flip it like um that? No, no, no. Uh, or, or, yeah, actually. It, Hang on, no, no, girl. There's, there's only ten minutes left. I, I can't, I can't let you okay. take over right now. So there's a door. Uh, but we can give it uh, instead of the door texture, we can give it the oak. So it looks, so it matches everything else, maybe. How's that sound, David? Is it the oak texture that we have. No, it's not oak. Is it oak? Okay, so yeah, we got an oak door. Cool. All right, so now we want it to we want it to open. Um, we want it to open when the player walks up. Um, we could have it swing open, but then it, it might push the player. Knock you to the side. Uh, How about it opens inside? It opens, opens into the in, inside. But then what if you're inside? Doors are annoying to do in video games. Uh, the simplest way is just to have it slide down into the ground, I guess, maybe. I don't know. For, for the game where I made the floating house... We'll do that. I, okay. For the game in the floating house, I just walk through my door. <laughs> for the game in the floating house, I just walk through my door. Mm -hmm. uh, Penguins living luxury. Okay, so uh, we're going to add a blueprint to this door here. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Click on the blue thing, and this is going to be called... Uh, uh, oak door, I don't know, seems really little to me. Again, I'm going to put it into the build directory and save. And here we have the oak door. And what we're going to do to it is we are going to add a new component to it. And the component we're going to add to it is called a trigger, uh, a sphere collision or a sphere trigger, it's called. And this is going to be the thing that, eh, do you want sphere? Uh, you know what, maybe let's do a box collision instead. So I'm going to add a box collision. And so what this is going to be, this is the area that if you walk up to the door, the door will open. Okay. And uh, um, I'm going to move it and scale it so that it kind of represents, it's invisible by the way, it's invisible in the world. You're not going to, you're not going to see this. You're, you'll see it in the, um, you'll see it in the editor, but not in not in the, in the game when you play it. And this shows you kind of like where the, um, like if the person walks up, it'll, it'll open the door a little bit taller. Maybe. Okay. And so you can use either a box collision or a sphere collision. Those are your two common things. Yeah, that's pretty good. I don't want an opening if like the person's on the roof, you know what I mean? Maybe I'll actually pull it down like one notch. 
It's like if a person's walking up here, it doesn't swing open underneath them. That'd be kind of weird. Okay, so if you if you walk up within like what a meter and a half of it, the door will open. Okay. Now, one important thing to note here is that when we just added that component, it's added as a child. You see how it's kind of like nested inside of this thing here. So if I were to move the door, the uh, if I were to move the door, the uh, the the box collision would move with it. Okay, and that's not what we want. So we want the box uh, for the collision to open the door to not move with the door. And so we have to change the parent of this. And so we do that by dragging it over onto the root node. Uh, let's see, drag to, uh, let's see, how do we pull it off? Um, mm, why are you not able to be reparented? The root, oh, that's the root component. Hmm, okay. Uh, so we're gonna have to add something different. Um, as the root component. Uh, let's add something that won't draw. Maybe. Um, and start over. It'll just be easier that way. Uh, okay, I'm going to take this door, delete it, and I'm going to just make a new uh, you, I'm delete you, force delete, because um, I, I don't want the root, I don't want the, the thing moving with the, the root of the node. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just create a new blueprint like this. It's going to be an actor. Actor is anything that can move in the world, and this will be called oak door again. Double click on it. And you can see the root is now this thing here, okay? And then I'm going to add to it, um, I'm going to add to it a door. So I'm going to add to it a door. Let's see if I can drag that in. Door, drag the door in here. Okay, so I'm adding the door to the thing. And then I'm going to add a uh, material onto this. The material I'm going to change to oak. Okay. Right. And good. All right. So now we got we're back where we were before, except the root is this point here. This point is like zero 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 essentially. Um, so we got the door, and then we're going to need to add the box component to, or the box collision to it. That. And then I'm going to go through that process again of moving it up and scaling it up. Kind of choosing, this is the area where like if you walk up to the door it'll, it'll activate. Good enough, I guess. Yeah. It's a bit of so, so you walk up to right about here. Mm -hmm. Make it a little, a little bigger. So you walk up to right about here, and then the door will open. That seems about uh, right. No, maybe a bit further because I think I'm still slime into you. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I think I'm gonna just have it slide through the floor, um, rather than swing outwards. No, just swing it outwards like that. Swing it outwards. Good. That might be just enough. Okay. Maybe even bigger. All right. Well, that, that point here, that white ball, that's the hinge that it'll rotate on. Okay, so now we got that, we can save this. And uh, and now you'll see that when the door moves, um, the, the box doesn't move with it, okay? If it was parented to it, and you can parent something by dragging it on top of something, it's like attached to it, right? So if I were to move the door now, oh, sorry. If I were to move the door now, the, uh, the, the box would move with it. Right, which is not what you want, right? 
uh, you want the area that the door opens to not move with it. So you have to just take the thing and drag it onto the root, attach, and they're they're um, they're going to be separate. So they won't move together. Um, okay. So uh, move left. Um, okay. So that looks pretty good. Now we're going to compile it, save it, and we're going to go over into the event graph. So the box. A box trigger or a box collision, um, by default, it should generate overlap events is set, good. And it's set to overlap all dynamics. So this should work by default. Okay. So we're going to go over into the event graph here. And we're going to have a new, we don't need event play, do we? Maybe we might need that later. Uh, but we're going to have here actor event begin overlap. And so that's going to be triggered when something overlaps some part of our um, object here. So in this case, when somebody walks into the zone, that's going to generate an overlap event. So that's the third thing or fourth thing we've learned today, the fourth event. We've got event tick, we've got event begin play, we've got event hit, which is when you touch something, and then event overlap is when you walk inside of something. So when I walk inside of that box trigger region, I'm going to activate something. And this is a very, very powerful technique we use in games. Um, there's only a few ways that you can interact with the world. The first way is you touch something. The second way is you overlap something, which is kind of the same thing, just uh, explained a little bit differently, whether or not you allow them to bounce or not. Um, then there's uh, sending a ray through the world to, like when you shoot a bullet and it hits the wall, that's another way. And uh, yeah. Um, about it <laughs> you know there's variants on, on all those things but you know that's, that's about it um, okay so when somebody overlaps the when somebody overlaps the door we are going to just start off by printing hello <laughs> right because again uh, whenever whenever I do development I always just make sure um, that works right so I'm gonna drag my I'm gonna drag my oak door out here and you'll see that it's a little itty bitty thing. So I'm going to scale it up like this, slide it over, scale it up a little bit more, slide it over. And that's uh, way too tall now. Uh, scale it down. The snap to grid is kind of killing me here. Uh, scaling, I'll just turn off snapping on it. Scroll it till it looks pretty good. Good. Okay. So the door the door fits now. All right. So uh, we got this door here, and I'm not, I'm now going to hit play. I'm going to walk over there, and if everything works right, when I enter that box zone, it'll hit hello, hello. See that? But it doesn't keep doing it. It does it once, and then when I leave. Nothing happens because I don't have an event set up to leave overlap. But watch when what I walk up again. What about the opening door? Hello. What about the opening door? I haven't coded it yet. And we'll have to pick that up on Monday. Okay, because we are out of time for today. So what is your homework assignment? Uh, your homework assignment is to build uh, some sort of moving object in the world. It could be... I, I don't want you guys just uh, recreating my elevator. That's a little bit boring, right? I'd like for you guys to... Make something yourself. You can make a, um, and it doesn't have to be just in the Z directions. Z directions up and down. You can make an airplane that flies around. Um, Walking a snowman. You can have the snowman. Yeah, you can animate the snowman so the snowman uh, slides around left and right. Okay. So uh, you have all weekend to do this. So uh, let's say, uh, yeah, let's say let's say you have two different objects in the world. And they animate around. They follow. They follow a, a, a path back and forth. So you can you can have a, a box that slides back and forth, or a rock, or or something. Like I want you to animate, you can animate two things. Okay. And uh, and we'll pick up how to do a door on Monday. Okay. Any questions, you guys? Uh, the hinge should. Oh no, that's that's correct. Yeah, there's the hinge. Yeah. So when we open it, it'll swing out. Yeah, you can do that. Okay. You're gonna make a moving escalator. Okay, you'd probably use the stairs for that. So I don't know. Mm. 
Maybe a little weird. I am avail I'm available 24-7 for office hours. Yes. Avalanche? An avalanche, that'd be cool. Yeah, that'd be really neat. Like, uh, you have rocks, like, you know, falling off a cliff or something like that. Or you know cool. how you did a bunch of barrels that were spawning on the top? Oh, yeah. Have barrels rolling down a hillside or something like that. So if you want to make an object appear, there's a, spheres on there's a uh, spawn actor uh, node that you can do to create objects in the world. That's not exactly animating what you want them to do, though. Maybe. Um, for an escalator, you might have to create new stairs and move them and then destroy them when they get to the top and spawn new ones at the bottom. Okay. Yeah. And they keep moving up. Any questions? So the, the blueprint uh, to do the elevator animation I've posted onto Discord. I don't want you guys just duplicating it. That's a little that's a little boring to just recreate what I do. Game development should be fun and exciting. So just find something in your world, like, I don't know. No copying. Uh, no direct copying. I mean, the, the idea is going to be the same. Uh, I don't know, maybe make the, the mushrooms follow you around. I don't know. Or maybe like sort of like yours, except it's like in a Mario level, how like they keep going up, multiple staircases keep going up, and the other ones go down on the other, yeah. other side of the level. Yeah. Or make a platforming a platformer, you know, so you, the person has to jump from like all the platforms are doing this. You have to like jump from one platform to the other, yeah, or the sliding sideways. Yeah. There's ideas. There's all, Mario, all sorts of ideas. Mario U, one that's like if you stand on it too low, it falls. That's right, yeah, or if you, yeah, you stand on it for long enough, then it drops underneath you, something like that. That'd be fun. Oh, oh shoot, I know you wanted to work on that. Here, let me, let me put it back up for you. Okay. So I'll put up the, I'll put up the video and I'll put up the uh, assignment on, on Canvas. You guys got till Monday to add some animated, animated stuff to your, to your levels. And if you want, uh, you can look into timelines. That's what I'm going to be talking about on Monday, doing animation using timelines. Yep. Um, but yeah, but what, what I've given you is good enough for now. Okay. So thanks, you guys. Have fun with it. Uh, as always, like game development is always fun. I know there's a lot to it, and it might hurt your brains a little bit sometimes, but um, it is it is fun making things and starting to see like how to actually make the world dynamic and interesting and stuff like that. So. Um, have fun, and I'm gonna turn my daughter loose on the level for 10 minutes. So people in uh, IS 50B hang out for 10 minutes. You let my daughter work on the level. Okay, right. I'll see you guys on Monday. It's gonna be like programming in C++. Eh, it's it's more visual. Yeah, same idea. See you guys.